This is Michael Popak, so it must be legal AF after dark. The New York Appellate Court once again has rejected Donald Trump's appeal, his attempt to get the gag order removed at the appellate level, having found no constitutional issue involved whatsoever, as Judge Mershon, the trial judge, considers whether to remove the gag order in time for the presidential debate in a few days between President Joe Biden and former whatever he was, Donald Trump. What will Judge Bershon do now that the appellate court has basically told him the gag order was fine? We cover it all. We analyze it all on Legal AF. Take a listen. Let me let me kick it off with a question. Do you think that Mershon, where where the issue does sit, it's not with the appeals court as we as we will talk about. It's with Mershon. Do you think he should or will and or will lift the gag order in advance of the debate? Or does the upcoming debate only strengthen his hand to keep the gag order in place since the debate happens before the sentencing? I mean, I don't see any reason to ever lift the gag order with respect to the jurors. There's no reason for him to ever be able to comment on the jurors who sat for this case. It could impact other people's willingness to sit for jury service. He's somebody who has a long history of uh, calling for violence, et cetera. And, um, And it's just, really crazy that anyone would ever consider uh, that a right or a First Amendment right to put jurors in jeopardy. You know, as as Donald Trump famously said in the Caitlin Collins town hall on CNN, um, my followers, uh, my listen, my followers listen to me like like no one else. And all if he starts uh, if he starts doing things to the jurors, you, you got another Shamos Ruby Freeman situation where people's lives are ruined just for volunteering and doing their civic duty. So I don't think that will ever happen with the jurors, nor should it. Um, like I said, there's no reason to ever talk about them. And I, I think it's actually fascinating that we've not heard, they haven't come forward. They've maintained their anonymity. I applaud them for that. I think it's smart and no nothing is leaked nobody has has figured it out nobody has said anything and so therefore they have really um really kind of dodged a bullet literally and figuratively um so i don't see the the that part of the gag order ever being lifted um i would say the same thing about the family members of the politician of the um prosecutor, sorry, and the court staff. There's no reason to ever go after family members either or the various people who are civil servants and who who are doing their jobs. Um, The gag order doesn't prevent Donald Trump from speaking out against Alvin Bragg or Judge Mershon. And so he can do and criticize and talk about the case all he wants. The one area that I think the judge might modify it has to do with some of the witnesses. Now, I I don't know that he will, uh, I don't know that he will lift it as to all witnesses because again, it just impacts the ability, like future people who might become witnesses if you know that that you'll be protected for a little while, but not forever. Um, It could really chill witnesses from wanting to come forward. So, however, I could see a carve out that has to do with people like Michael Cohen, who, although I don't think he should be threatened, and I think the power that Donald Trump has compared to uh, any power, she has none, Michael Cohen has, um, even the audience that each of them have is is just uh, not comparable. You know, Donald Trump is is much um, the power dynamic is is you know he's much much more powerful. Obviously, um, that being said, Michael Cohen speaks publicly about Donald Trump, and so I can imagine a scenario where the judge would say, "You can respond to that." Stormy Daniels has remained um, quiet, and but if she were to change that, maybe he would change that. I don't know. I could see that that's the area that I could see the judge potentially 
making some exceptions, but the rest, I, I don't see him lifting it. There's no reason to. There's no reason to ever have to talk about those individuals and um, put their lives in danger. So, so that's kind of what, what, where I think he will, where the judge will land on the gag order. But, you know, the Court of Appeals <clears throat> just basically, the, the gag order was in place, right? And that Judge Mershon um, imposed. Then they appealed it to the middle level court, uh, which is called the appellate division here in New York. They kept the gag order in place. They, then Donald Trump went to the New York's highest court, the Court of Appeals, and they just denied it um, on on Tuesday. They just said, you know, basically there's no constitutional there's no constitutional question directly involved. And so, yeah, it's just a couple of lines here. I appeal dismissed without cost by the court sua sponte, which means on their own, upon the ground that no substantial constitutional question is directly involved. That's from uh, Chief Judge Wilson. Um, Judge Halligan took no part. Judge Halligan is Caitlin Halligan, who used to work in the Manhattan DA's office, uh, and I used to work with her. She was the general counsel there, so that's why she took no part and recused herself since this is a Manhattan DA case. Um, so uh, essentially, they basically said there's no constitutional issue, which is interesting because he's constantly saying First Amendment, First Amendment, First Amendment, right? The gag order prevents me First Amendment. And they just dismissed it outright saying, sorry, Constitution's not implicated. There's no constitutional question here. So, so uh, it's just another example of him um, saying what he thinks something is, but courts uh, saying it's not true and of course he continues it so yeah i don't I, I that's that's where i see the gag order yeah I, I agree with you he still has an opportunity with the appellate court there's another 30-day application that he can make they're not they seem to have no interest whatsoever at the court of appeals level having he, him having lost already at the intermediary appellate court of the appellate part of the first department appellate division which sits in manhattan now he's a two-time loser at the appellate level. He almost always loses at the appellate level in almost all of his cases, except when we, we, we you and I will talk about the Supreme Court at the appropriate time, um, uh, when we finally get decisions related to Donald Trump, which will either be this week or, you know, we roll into uh, into July, meaning roll into never appearance case before the election. On the uh, gag order, I agree with you. I think you just leave it in place. I don't. I don't think. I think the debate that's coming up is the reason to keep the gag order in place because it'll just give him a megaphone of unlimited wattage uh, for you know 50, 80 million people for him to go after and put crosshairs on the back of people that are just doing their civic duty and our civil servants and are part of our criminal justice system and they're just doing their job. Do you think uh, he's going to show up to the debate? Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I mean, they work so hard to challenge Biden and then any time, any place. And and so they, all right, so they pick the time and a place and they, oh, I don't want to do it with the presidential debate committee and I don't want to, and they're, okay, we won't do it with them. All right. I mean, he's been accommodated in every way. I think it would be a terrible political misstep for, Bi uh, for Trump not to now debate Biden. I think it's all in favor. The wind is totally at the sail of Joe Biden, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what's your, what's your, what have you heard or what do you think on that? I mean, I, I've heard nothing. I just, he, he, he just seems to be looking for excuses to get out of it, right? He, every, if yeah. he's constantly finding obstacles, you know, drug testing and whatever, yeah. all these obstacles. You think so the I, gag I, order could be? You mean he would, he would say then, oh, I'm subject to a gag order. Exactly. I, just, I would love to tell you everything, but I'm being gagged. That's what uh, my I, first initial thought was, but yeah. who knows? That's not bad. I, I don't, like, I don't think I, like, I like him. that. That's, that's, I'll have to marinate he's, on that Because he's chicken. One. Well, that we know. I, I said marinate, you said chicken. See, that's why you and I get along so well. Plus, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm, I'm down a meal every day <laughs> since, since, we're, since the clock has started. So, yeah. we okay, we got good on that. Then sentencing, we're waiting on two filings. We're waiting on the your old office. Um, I'm sorry, Trump to go first. We're waiting on Trump to file. I think it's later this week. Could be early next week. The, their recommendations for sentencing, which we know is going to be no sentence. Um, <laughs> they're just going to be a political campaign screed masquerading as a sentencing memo. Uh, we'll get that. And then um, I think it's June 27th 
for some reason that, that's a date in my head. Uh, Alvin Bragg and his team there is going to be submitting their pre-sentencing memo. And then there's the pre-sentencing report, which we're hoping to get our hands on if it's made public. And we'll be able to talk about that with the interview and the dossier and all the background research and all their recommendations from the probation department. And then all, all these inputs go in and get plugged into Judge Mershon, who frankly makes the final decision. He's always had Donald Trump's uh justice in his hands <laughs> i was being kind there uh and um we'll see what he's gonna do i mean i, I don't know i wouldn't bash and attack the person who's who my liberty is dependent upon but you know donald trump does does a lot of weird demented things that make him unstable um and um for the presidency and so that's what that's what we've continued to watch um it, before we it, um go ahead sorry no just in addition to the sentencing memos sure. um so a couple of things. There might be some pre-trial motions that they, or I should say post-trial motions that they file. So that will, you will also see that. Um, and then the, the prosecutor would respond to that as well. So who knows if they're going to make any yep. crazy motions post-trial, but, but I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to do that and say things like there wasn't enough evidence or who knows, oh, yeah. whatever, whatever they'll oh. say. Well, it'll be their appellate brief. I agree with you. It'll be, it'll be their appellate brief. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then know, the other, I, yeah, no, go ahead. No, it's just the, the other thing I was going to say is the probation report is, mm -hmm. is not public. Um, I know, but so, <laughs> in, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not something you usually get to see. So unless somebody, you know, somehow gets a, hand, uh, a hold yeah. of it, it's not something that we can necessarily count on seeing. Um, but I, it'll certainly be referred to at the sentencing. And in particular, what I think it'll be, I, I think you're going to see, unless he's changed his tune, that he shows no remorse, he takes no responsibility and denies. That Won't it, it be in the briefing, though, Karen? I mean, they they, they can refer to the They sentence. can refer to it, yes. Right. So we'll, that, see, we'll, we'll get a glimmer. We can patch it together from the pieces that are referenced in each other's exactly. sentencing memos. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. All right. Well, that, that makes me feel better. You know, I, I was thinking, I was, I was kind of scratching out some notes here. I, I think it is totally appropriate that on Juneteenth, we recognize that three, and if you add Judge Chutkin in there, four of the major figures that are responsible for bringing Donald Trump to justice are black or African American. Uh, I know that's something that's that that Donald Trump has recognized because he has found ways to be out and out racist in his comments about all of them, whether it's calling uh, Fawny Willis Fanny and calling her a whore, which he did, as did Rudy Giuliani, or it's um, so or Letitia James calling her Peekaboo James, which is a terrible play on a racist trope and comment. Or comments he's made about Alvin Bragg, like he's subhuman, and so you can just take a baseball bat to him. And I think at the end of the day, when history is written, um, it's important to recognize that the um, uh, courage uh, that's been exhibited by these attorney generals, prosecutors, and judges just happen to reside inside of African American and Black Americans. I mean, Fawny Willis, I, there's so much about her that I've always respected. Just a few days ago, she went back in front of a yet another historical black church and defended herself, even though she sort of played with fire a little bit with that um, on Martin Luther King Day, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, when she gave the speech that became the focus, a large focus of at least Donald Trump's motion to disqualify her. But you know what? She's part of that community. She's proud to be a part of that community. That community supports her, as do all thinking Americans. She won her primary by an overwhelming amount. It was like 70 to 30, 70 70 percent to 30 percent. And I'm, yeah, I, I I want I want to I want to acknowledge that. And you and you've done a very good job, as always, on this podcast and on your own, not your own. I mean, <laughs> these are all your own uh, on uh, mistrial in talking about it from your perspective and talking about the women particularly that are have come up so strong in bringing Donald Trump to justice. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, e. Jean Carroll, for example, is somebody who I give so much credit, everything that she had to face and she had to deal with, um, and she came forward and just the vitriol both publicly and personally that she had to face, 
yet she had the strength to sit through these trials and face him down uh, despite all of that, or whether it's Letitia James or Fonnie Willis um, or, you know, the judges, Judge Chutkin, just the, the women who, um, who've really had to withstand so much more and so much, so heinous and horrific. I mean, we're going to be talking about Matt Gates in a little while and uh, just, you know, he's, he's basically accused of having sex with underage girls and, and paying for it. But Donald Trump re- reveres him and someone like Fonnie Willis has a consensual adult relationship with uh, somebody and somehow, you know, with Nathan Wade, who was a prosecutor uh, in her office, who was a judge and was a, a high level, um, a high level uh, uh, person. He wasn't necessarily like a, a the, the power dynamic was very equal there. Um, so just because she was technically his boss um, and somehow she is treated like, you know, like like she's some kind of uh, sex crazed maniac. And um, and now that case is in jeopardy because she had a consensual adult relationship. And and, you know, look at Donald Trump, where, whether it's sleeping with a porn star and paying her off and, you know, the sexual assaults of, of people like E. Jean Carroll and somehow he gets away with it. So just the, the, the double standards with women and people of color and everything that just really when you look at Donald Trump and his cronies and how they all conduct themselves versus the upstanding men and women who are involved in trying to um, bring him justice. It's just the, the contrast is, is just appalling to me. So. And one that I, you, I think you and I are, are proud to talk about, and I'm proud to have you as my partner, but proud to talk about on this particular episode. Um, we're going to talk about um, Matt Gates and what it means for the hollowing out of MAGA that seems to have no morals and no values, and yet tries to portray itself as the second party in our political system. Um, we just had a um, major mega church pastor who was a Trump spiritual advisor on more than one occasion, stepped down because he had underage, he had sex with an underage girl. I think she was 12 while he was living in her house when he was not 12. Um, and finally got forced out um, of the church. But again, this is the type of people that Donald Trump surrounds himself with. And listen, uh, there was a reason my mother used to say, you know, you're judged by the company you keep, birds of a feather. Uh, People that are evaluating, and if there are still people out there that are on the fence about the upcoming election, one of the factors or one of the metrics you can use is who who is in this person's life? Who has this person chosen to be in his life? Well, every person that Donald Trump has hired that that has mattered has either been indicted, lost their and or lost their bar, bar license, and or has been found in contempt, and or has committed other crimes and other fraud. Um, that's the professional judgment of Donald Trump, right? Um, and everybody around him, and or has committed sex crimes. And he surrounds himself with other misogynists that have committed sex crimes. And this is okay. I posited in a recent hot take. It's one thing to have a presidency turn criminal like Nixon. It's another thing for people to overtly vote for a criminal, convicted felon, and with all these other things that, yes, weren't crimes, but they were darn close to it, like the E. Jean Carroll rape uh, in terms of the, the process, the uh, civil fraud uh, and all of that. And if and if you're trying to look at the person's body of work, what is this telling you about that person's body of work? The people he considers to be his spiritual advisors who have underage sex, the people who support him in MAGA Congress who have under, who, who, who basically, underage sex, who raped a girl. I mean, let's call it for what it is. Uh, and, and people are actually thinking that they're going to vote for him. The good news is it looks like finally, finally, the convictions have seeped into the water table, into the water supply, and now it's showing up in the polling. And now the natural electoral advantage of Joe Biden, for good reason, is coming to the front. 
and and the votes are flipping like flip 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 in all the major battle gra- battleground states where Donald Trump has to hold on to every bit of what he got last time plus he has to get more it's the plus he has to get more is the problem for him because if if the polling is right it's not always right but if the polling is right there's a leakage between 8 and 20% out of the bucket for people who just won't vote for him because he's a convicted felon, including one out of five independents. And if that holds true, okay, then Biden is reelected. That that is obvious. So right at that intersection of law and politics, where we always sit, Karen, me, and Ben, um, this is where it is coming to fruition. Welcome back. That's a podcast that we started to call Legal AF about four years ago, and now you know why. And if you don't know why, join us for the full podcast at, on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on this YouTube channel for the Midas Touch Network. We're exclusively there. We curate the top four or five stories at the intersection of law and politics. We bring it to you just the way we just did. No censorship. We don't blow smoke or sunshine. Karen Freeman Ignifolo and I do it on Wednesdays. Ben Micellis and me do it on uh, Saturdays, and then we do hot takes like this one about every hour at that same intersection of law and politics. If you know about Legal AF, we really appreciate you being part of our audience, and I wanted to take the time to thank you here. If you uh, Take that clip, though. It'll really help us. We don't have a marketing department. Send it off to friends, family, people in your life, and say, hey, you should say it like that. Hey, you know, you know that podcast Legal AF I tell you about? Here's a clip, and that little bite-sized Legal AF may actually get them to join our audience. And we appreciate you for doing that. If you don't know what I'm talking about or who I am, I'm Michael Popak. That was Legal AF. And I invite you to join us on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. So until my next hot take, till my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.